Let's pray. Lord, you spoke the words through your prophet Isaiah that as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and don't return there without watering the land, providing seed for the sower and bread for the eater, in the same way, so your word will be, it will not return to you void, it will not return to you empty without accomplishing what you desire, without fulfilling the very thing which you set it out to accomplish and do. And so therefore, upon that promise, the promise of the power of your word, God, we ask you this morning to accomplish the work of faith in this place. As we turn to the gospel of John, may faith arise for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. We turn this morning to John chapter 11, one of the greatest chapters in the book of John. And uh, we are going to attempt, or not attempt, we're going to do, right, this morning, 53 verses. How many of you think it can be done? Nobody, what? Come on. Oh Lord, oh Lord, help these, no. Um, so let's begin. John chapter 11, verses 1 through 53, if you'll read along with me, following your Bibles or following the screen behind me. It says, Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was the Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So the sister sent word to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. But when Jesus heard this, he said, This sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he then stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. And the disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? And Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. And this he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. But I go so that I may awaken him out of sleep. The disciples then said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. And then Jesus, now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he was speaking of literal sleep. So Jesus then said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Therefore, Thomas, who is called Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, so that we may die with him. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. And Martha, therefore, when she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him, but Mary stayed at the house. Martha then said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, Yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. And when she had said this, she went away and called Mary, her sister, saying secretly, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and was coming to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha met him. And then the Jews who were with her in the house and consoling her, 
When they saw that Mary got up quickly and went out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Therefore, when Mary came where Jesus was, she saw him and fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled and said, Where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. Verse 35 says, Jesus wept. So the Jews were saying, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man also from dying? And Jesus, again, being deeply moved within, came to the tomb. And now it was a cave and a stone was lying against it. And Jesus said, remove the stone. Martha, the sister of the deceased, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be a stench, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they removed the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But because of the people standing around, I said it, so that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. The man who had died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw that saw what he had done, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them the things which Jesus had done. And verse 47 says, Therefore the chief priests and the Pharisees convened a council and were saying, What are we doing? For this man is performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, all men will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation." But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you take into account that it is expedient for you that one man die for the people and that the whole nation not perish. Now he did not say this on his own initiative, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation and not for the nation only, but in order that he might also gather together into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. In verse 53, we conclude on, which says, So from that day on, they planned together to kill him. We find at the end of chapter 10, after Jesus had revealed himself to be the good shepherd, if you remember those sermons in chapter 10, by which he explained his sacrificial care he explained his divine protection over the sheep after he explained his divine and sovereign security for his true sheep the result was that many of the jewish people took up stones in order to execute him on the charge of blasphemy we saw that towards the end of chapter 10 But it says that once again, Jesus had eluded their grasp because his time had not yet come. There was going to be a time where his arrest and his execution would happen, but that time was not in John chapter 10. It would come later. And so as a result, we find this in John 10, verses 40 through 42 whereby it says, And Jesus went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was first baptizing, and he was staying there. And many came to him and were saying, While John performed no sign, yet everything John said about this man was true, and many believed in him there. So in a sense, we find that Jesus has ended up where he began. At the beginning of his earthly ministry, clear back in chapter 1 of John, if you can remember back, Jesus had appeared in the wilderness near the Jordan River where John the Baptist was baptizing. And at that place, Jesus was revealed specifically 
through the prophetic announcement of John the Baptist, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We see that Jesus was revealed at his baptism when the voice of the Father spoke from heaven, saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And thirdly, by the visible dissension of the Holy Spirit upon Jesus at his baptism. So we find at that time, Jesus began his three-year, roughly three-year ministry. And now, at the end of those three years, we find Jesus, ironically, returning to the same location. And it says here that many were coming to him and believing in him. But as Jesus and his disciples were in this place, you have to kind of think that maybe this was a peaceful time, a place of rest maybe, amongst the chaos of what they just come out of in Jerusalem. But in the midst of this, they received a message. And uh, this message came to them from a specific family, a family that Jesus knew well, two sisters and a brother. These two sisters are identified for us as Martha and Mary. Mary is identified further as the one who had anointed the feet of Jesus during a luncheon with, at, a, uh, at a Pharisee's house. And I'm sure you remember the story. And so it is this Mary and her sister Martha who are named as two of the main characters, but also the other very important person in this story is their brother, Lazarus. And it needs to be noted very significantly in verse 5, which says this. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Jesus knew this family well. They were not strangers. There was a relationship of love here. Jesus loved them. And this is very important. And so these siblings whom Jesus loved sent this message explaining that they were in a very difficult situation. There was a deep concern. There was a growing fear. So they sent word to him saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Our brother Lazarus is sick, desperately sick. In fact, he is on the very edge of death. If something drastic doesn't happen immediately, in the next few days, he is going to die. Jesus, we know you love him. We know you're able to do all things. Therefore, we make you aware of our need. Won't you please come and heal our brother? So therefore, it says that when Jesus heard about the sickness of the one whom he loved, Jesus chose to stay two days longer in the wilderness. He didn't depart immediately to go see his sick friend. He intentionally delayed the journey two days. And as a result, Lazarus dies. And so it is probably easy at this point, if we pause a moment in the narrative, it's probably easy to get a little bit confused maybe even a bit bent out of shape. Jesus, why would you do this to somebody you love? Why wouldn't you just immediately go and, and heal them, raise them up, prosper them, bless them? Why would you delay for two days and allow this great tragedy to happen? But what Scripture tells us is that this delay is about to serve a very specific purpose. In fact, it has a twofold purpose. First of all, it is for the glory of God generally. And second of all, it is for the glory of Christ specifically, in which he is about to make one of the most amazing declarations that mankind has ever heard in which verses 25 and 26 testify about saying, Jesus speaking, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? 
So we find that this is very intentional for a very specific purpose. So as we continue the story, after making this profound statement, to show that he is serious about it, Jesus shows up on the scene at the tomb and calls out his friend, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus does. So from this great miracle, it's called a miracle, resurrection's a miracle, right? It's supernatural, this is not normal. So from this great miracle, which contains so many verses that we've read today, and each one has great oceans of truth and depth of meaning, we need to ask what we can learn Or maybe a better question, what can we learn in the next few minutes together this morning that will be relevant to our life? And so the direction I want to take us in this morning, because it seems so very relevant, are three very specific points, which are this. If you have your outline, you can can look at these, but the first of which is that the kingdom's perspective regarding death. This story of Lazarus opens our eyes and explains to us that the kingdom of God has a very different perspective of death than we do. We need to note that. Second of all, the direction I want to take us in is in regards to the sovereign power of the voice of the king of this kingdom. And thirdly, as we will conclude this morning, we need to mention the overarching purpose of Jesus resurrecting his friend Lazarus. So with that, we dig in to the very first point regarding the kingdom perspective of death. This is so very important. So first of all, as we seek to understand death, not merely from an earthly view, but with a biblical perspective, with a Christian worldview and the perspective of the kingdom of God, We need to take note of the language that is used to describe it. The language that the Bible uses to describe death is very unique. It's very different than the kind of language that we use when we talk about death. Specifically, we see this in both Old Testament and New Testament. And there is one word which surfaces over and over again to describe death, and it is the word Sleep. For example, in Daniel chapter 12, at the end of his ministry, the Lord speaks to Daniel about what is about to happen, what is going to come next, what is going to happen to his people Israel who are in exile in Babylon. And God says simply they're going to sleep in the dust of the earth and then one day be awakened. Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, God speaking. Now at that time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people, Daniel, will arise, and there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book, will be rescued. And here it is. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake. These to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. God doesn't tell Daniel many of these who are dead will rise. He says many of these who are asleep, that have gone to sleep in the dust of the ground even, will wake up. And he says a similar thing to Daniel personally in verse 13. As for you, Daniel, go your way to the end then you will enter your rest and rise again for your allotted portion at the end of the age. Sleep, rest are used in context to describe death. Or another example, this one from the New Testament, from the Apostle Paul to the Corinthians, in order to comfort the Corinthians, in order to correct some of their thinking and their theology in regards to resurrection 
Uh, the great chapter 15 is written, one of my favorite chapters. I just said John 11 is my favorite chapter, but actually John or 1 Corinthians 15 is my favorite chapter. But anyway, they're both good. You get the idea. But in the midst of this, Paul, Paul establishes kingdom thinking about death and resurrection. And he says this in 1 Corinthians 15, 51. He says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, reference to death. But we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. In both of these examples, Daniel, 1 Corinthians, instead of calling death, death, another descriptive word and concept which is used and serves the perspective of the kingdom better, is the word sleep. We ask the question, well, why in the world does the Bible do this? Why not just call it death? Death is death. And the reason is because as Scripture teaches, at the end of this life, when this earthly tent wears out, either through old age, tragic accident, severe sickness, our body and our soul become separated. Philippians tells us that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, so we find the principle that our soul goes to be in the presence of the Lord, while our body goes to the grave, ashes to ashes, and dust to dust. And this condition of our earthly body, which we call death, is described in the kingdom as sleep. And just as with our earthly understanding of sleep, there will be a time when we awake. Now this might seem ridiculous. It might seem like, Pastor, you're splitting hairs again. But we need to understand, with eyes of faith, that death is not the end. And this is what the kingdom language is teaching us. Just like sleep that is temporary, you get six hours of sleep, eight hours of sleep, for some of you, 12 hours of sleep, eventually you wake up and you're refreshed and you're renewed and you're ready for the new day. And this analogy applies in describing death. It's temporary. There's coming a resurrection. There's coming a transformation, a renewal. So while this may be difficult to understand, let me give you another passage of Scripture that's helpful to our understanding. And, and it's a story, it's another story, it's a long story too, we won't take the time, but um, just some highlights. But it's the story of the daughter of Jairus in Mark. In it we find that one day a very important Jewish leader of a very prominent synagogue approached Jesus and he began pleading with him on behalf of his daughter who was sick and near death. And so Jesus begins the journey to his house, but is delayed along the way. And as a result, the man's daughter dies. Very similar to this story in John 11 of Nazareth, or of Lazarus. And it says in Mark chapter 5, picking up in verse 38, it says, They came to the house of the synagogue official, and Jesus saw a commotion. And people loudly weeping and wailing. And entering in, he said to them, Why make a commotion and weep? The child has not died, but is asleep. Jesus uses kingdom language too. They began laughing at him. But putting them all out, he took along the child's father and mother and his own companions and entered the room where the child was. And taking the child by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which translated means, little girl, I say to you, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk, for she was 12 years old. And immediately they were completely astounded. And he gave them strict orders that no one should know about this. And I love this last <laughs> this last phrase, you know, it's like, why is this in here? I love this so much. God is so good. And he said that something should be given her to eat. 
She's 12 years old. She's hungry. She's been sick. Give her some food. <laughs> An amazing story. But the important point that I want you to note from everything that we've said, including the story of, from Mark, is that the language of Scripture regarding death is radically different from that of the world. With our earthly perspective, physical death is often seen as the tragic end of someone's existence. It becomes a number on a tombstone. But the grave is not the end. Daniel, your people are only sleeping until that day when you are awakened out of the dust. Corinthians, you are only going to fall asleep, sleeping. And then in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, you will be raised immortal, imperishable, and incorruptible eternally. Jairus, your daughter is only sleeping. Little girl, get up. So we find in the same way, Jesus uses this same kingdom language to describe the condition of Lazarus. John eleven eleven. Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. But I go so that I may awaken him out of sleep. And the disciples said to him, Well, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he'll recover. They didn't understand the kingdom language. But now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought he was speaking of literal sleep. They were confused. And I think we can be confused as well. Lord, may you open the eyes of our faith to understand that the grave is not the end. So that is point one. So much more could be said. Someday maybe I'll write a book. The second sub-point, though, is the lamentable tragedy of death. So while it's important to understand the hope-filled language of the kingdom, at the same time we must not remove the tension of the tragedy of death by diminishing its lamentable condition. Right? Here's what I mean. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, including mankind and everything else that is in it, death was not part of the equation. It was only after the temptation and the fall of Adam and Eve in which death entered the picture. We find this for reference in Genesis 3.19. God speaking to Adam. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. After a life of difficulty and turmoil caused by sin, Congratulations, Adam. At the end of it all, you get to return to the dust. You get to die. But as a result of their sin, its consequences of death, the consequences of sin is death, this has spread universally to all of mankind. For reference again, Romans 5.12. Therefore, just as through one man, Adam, sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, all of humanity, all people. Why? Because all have sinned. We are all born with a sinful nature. Thank you, Adam and Eve. And as a result, therefore, death has spread universally to everyone. This means that the death rate amongst humanity is 100%. And it carries with it a very great sorrow as God declares in Ezekiel 18. For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies, declares the Lord God. Therefore, repent and live. This is talking both physically and spiritually, I believe, but I think you get the point. God's not happy about death. He has no joy. He has no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies. Even God recognizes the sad tragedy that death brings into this world. This is what we see from Jesus in John eleven thirty three, When Jesus therefore saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled and said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And then the, you know, the shortest verse in the whole Bible, two words, Jesus wept. 
over death, over the lamentable situation. So therefore, we need to understand that though the kingdom would use language pointing to death as being a temporary condition, similar to sleep, it is also still a very lamentable and sad condition which even God grieves over. So this then takes us to the very next point. Will God allow this grief to go on forever? So with what we have seen so far, knowing what we know about Jesus, it may be tempting to ask, well, why didn't Jesus just go and heal Lazarus before he died so that all of this grief could be avoided in the first place, right? If I were God, that's what I would have done. I mean, why allow so much sorrow, God? I hate death. This was the argument from some of the Jews who were gathered together that day. Their argument was, couldn't this man who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Right? They had witnessed the miracle of this blind man who had been born that way, all of a sudden being able to see. And they're saying, well, Jesus did that. How come he couldn't help Lazarus? And this is a question that's probably asked by a lot of skeptics today. If Christianity is real, if God really does exist, if Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, then why does God still allow the tragedy of suffering and sickness and death to permeate the earth? In fact, I think many who at one time may have even considered themselves to be Christians have stumbled over this very idea. Is God not powerful enough to stop death? Or is He not good enough to stop death? death but there's a better answer there's a better question the answer is because god has a greater good in allowing the evil of death to continue at least for this season in humanity's history god has allowed death for a very good reason we see this in the story of lazarus it's very very easily established this answer in the story of Lazarus. In verse 14, actually I think, yeah, 14, Jesus has the audacity to tell his disciples, I am glad for your sake that I was not with Lazarus in order to prevent him from dying. What? You were were glad that you didn't prevent him from dying? Glad for the disciples' sake? Why did Jesus delay coming to Bethany for two days so that Lazarus died, right? Let's just ask it straight out. We find our answer answer in verse 11. Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go so that I may awaken him out of sleep. The action of resurrection was infinitely greater and better, bringing more glory to God than his death. So he allowed the death for the greater glory of resurrection why was it important for Lazarus to die or in the language of the kingdom to fall asleep so that he might be publicly resurrected so that everybody would see it and why was it important that he be publicly resurrected three reasons I gave you one but let's split them into three first so that God would be glorified verse four When Jesus heard this, he said, this sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Secondly, so the people would believe in Christ. Verse 15, I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, so that you may believe, therefore let us go to him. And thirdly, so that it would be known that even death bows to the sovereign power of God. You think about the resurrections of the Bible, right? Think about Elijah and Elisha. You think about the ones that happened in the New Testament. Imagine if none of those were in the Bible, if we knew nothing about resurrection at all. Would that change your perspective of who God is? It should. 
but rather we see resurrection as the glory of God, as the power of God manifested, giving us great hope. It's very important. So that's what I mean by God has allowed Lazarus' death for a greater good, a greater glory. Here's a verse to back that up, 1 Corinthians 15, 54. When this perishable, Paul writes, this perishable, this body, will have put on the imperishable resurrection, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, the prophetic promise. Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? <laughs> Jesus has swallowed it up. Death, which is the great swallower of life itself, it swallows families, it swallows friends, it swallows co-workers, it swallows those in their infancy, it swallows those in their prime, it swallows those in their golden years, it swallows men, it swallows women, it swallows the poor, it swallows the rich, it swallows whole nations and tribes. Death is the great enemy of human existence, but <laughs> this great swallower itself will one day be swallowed in great victory in the name of Jesus Christ. So why did Jesus delay his arrival in Bethany, therefore allowing Lazarus to fall asleep so that the whole world would be witness to the fact that even death bows to the sovereignty of God? This is very good news. So with that, I want to next draw your attention to how God displays his victory over death. How he accomplishes it. And we want to talk about the voice of the king. The sovereign voice of God. If we talk about it in a general sense, we find that the Bible has a lot to say. That the voice of the Lord is shown to be, if I can use a, a theological nerdy term as I have come to recognize myself to do often, uh, is the term of causal power. The Lord's voice has causal power. This is what I mean. When God speaks, stuff happens. <laughs> it isn't like some of us, as parents, when we speak to our children, you know, go clean your room and nothing happens, you know, I'm not talking about Zion because he's, he's a perfect kid, but. Why is Carson laughing right now? I don't, anyway. <laughs> God's voice has causal power in the sense that when God speaks, things happen. When God speaks, there is a result his voice is the cause, what happens is the effect, and there is always an effect when God speaks. An example of this is creation, whereby God spoke and the universe sprang into existence. The causal power was God speaking, His voice. The effect was that the heavens and the earth and everything contained within it was brought into existence and given life. This is real power from nothing came something how god spoke that's amazing that's amazing you spend the rest of your life meditating on that fact and be overwhelmed by the whole thing consider psalm 29 verses 4 through 9 you can read the whole thing on your own time but 4 through 9 specifically this morning the voice of the Lord is powerful, understatement of the year. The voice of the Lord is majestic, another understatement, but in our limited understanding of language, that's where we begin. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. Yes, the Lord breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. 
He makes Lebanon skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord hews out flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. And the voice of the Lord makes the deer to calve and strips the forest bare. And in his temple, everything says glory. And at the point of all of this is the causal power of the voice of God. That's the whole point of Psalm 29. Or consider Job, Job 37, 2 through 6. Listen closely to the thunder of God's voice and the rumbling that goes out from his mouth. Under the whole heaven he lets it loose and his lightning to the ends of the earth. After it a voice roars, he thunders with his majestic voice and he does not restrain the lightnings when his voice is heard. God thunders with his voice wondrously doing great things which we cannot comprehend. For to the snow, he says, fall on the earth, and to the downpour and the rain, be strong. Job here compares the causal power of the voice of God to a mighty thunderstorm with all its rumblings, its lightnings and thunders. Or consider Isaiah 55. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth and making it bear and sprout and furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So will my word be, God says, which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire or without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. The causal power of God's voice always produces an effect. So the voice of the Lord generally, now the voice of the Lord particularly in the sense of resurrection. In a more specific sense, consider the powerful voice of the, of the Lord in regard to resurrection. Just as God spoke and the universe came into being, just as God spoke and the cedars of Lebanon are broken into pieces, as Psalm says, just as the Lord spoke and the wilderness of Kadesh is shaken, Psalm 29 says, just as the Lord spoke and the snow falls, the rain is driven, and just as the desire of the kingdom is fulfilled perfectly when he speaks, in the same way, in the near future, God is going to speak again. And the dead who have fallen asleep in Christ will rise from the ashes and from the dust of the grave to shine like the brilliance of the sun at noonday and like the stars at night. Daniel 12, 13. How can we know this? How can we know this? Right, Pastor, you're just up there saying a bunch of stuff. Give me evidence. Here's the evidence. Lazarus. Lazarus. This whole thing is so that we believe in the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. The one who is able to speak and cause dead bones to live. I mean, consider the magnitude of this. Jesus delayed two days coming to Lazarus. Had that story written in a book. So that this group of people and those watching from home could be gathered together to hear this story as it becomes a first-hand witness to the power of the sovereign voice of God over death. As he cries out in John chapter 11, Lazarus, come forth. And after being dead for four days, Lazarus came forth. And all of this is a testimony to you and me of the power of God's resurrection. God went to great lengths so you would believe in the resurrection. Maybe that's not enough. Let me give you one more. <laughs> Ezekiel 37. Paul says, you know, in Corinthians, he says, man, this is a great mystery. I'm going to tell you this great mystery about resurrection. And there's sense of it that, ah, 
there's parts we don't know. Right? So, Lord, help me to understand. And I think one place we can go to is Ezekiel 37, 1 through 10. Whole chapter, but 1 through 10. It says this, Ezekiel speaking, The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. And it was full of bones. And he caused me to pass among them round about, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and lo, they were very dry. So get this picture of this valley, and God brings Ezekiel in the spirit, and all these dry bones are laying on top of the ground, right? And they're, they're dry bones. They've been, they've been dead for a long time. There's no flesh still attached to these bones. So God says to Ezekiel, Son of man, can these bones live? <laughs> what kind of a question is that, you know? And so I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. And so again he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O oh dry bones, hear the word of the Lord, the voice of God. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, that you may come to life. I will put sinews on you, make flesh grow back on you, cover you with skin, and put breath in you, that you may come alive, and you will know that I am the Lord. So Ezekiel says, I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise. Can you imagine it? There was a noise. As Ezekiel is speaking, being the mouthpiece of God, he says, Behold, there was a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, sinews were on them, and flesh grew, and skin covered them. But there was no breath in them. So then God said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord of God. The voice of God says this, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these that are slain, that they may come to life. So Ezekiel says, I prophesied as God commanded me. And the breath came into them, and they came to life. And stood on their feet an exceedingly great army. Can you imagine that? <laughs> I hope so, because it's our future. So, let me conclude. We ask again, and with fresh motivation for application, why is this story in the Bible? John chapter 11. Why did God see fit to make sure that everybody knew about it by putting it in a book? The answer is twofold. First, so that God would be glorified, as I've already mentioned several times. Second, so that those who would see this glory would also believe. At the end of this story, we find there are two categories of response, two different groups of people. Those who believe him, I mean, they just saw Lazarus come out of a tomb. How can you not believe, right? But there are also those who did not believe, and these who did not believe also choose to betray him. It says there in verse 46, but some of them went to the Pharisees and told them the things which Jesus had done. Was there a crime in raising a man from the dead? Evidently, they felt so. So as a result, we find that the Pharisees convened their Sanhedrin council in order to determine what they should do about this man, Jesus. He's healing the lame. He's healing the blind. And now he's raising the dead. Therefore, we need to do something about this guy or else we're going to lose our social status with the Romans. <laughs> so 
So it says from that day on in verse 53, they planned together to kill him. Great irony of ironies. Their plan was to kill the very one who has the power over death. He has the power to raise the dead. How are you going to kill this man? In their foolish minds, they became even more foolish and even more reprobate, to use the language of Romans 1. And so let me hover over this point just one moment as we close, because I think there's a real lesson, a real application point, as we see these who choose not to believe, who choose to betray him, in fact. And let me say this, a person can only suppress the truth of Jesus Christ so long before foolishness becomes their standard of life. A person can only exchange the glory of God so long before the heart is given over to ultimate depravity. A person can only lie in order to worship themselves instead of their Creator for so long before the natural functions of men and women are exchanged and abandoned for that which is unnatural and degenerate. Romans chapter 1. Or a person can only ignore the clear evidence of the sovereignty of Jesus Christ so long before unbelief leads you to think that you can kill God. The ugliness of unbelief has no end. It is so dark, so deceptive. So therefore, I leave... I leave us this morning with the words of Jesus once again. And, and may they serve as a, a burr in your saddle, a stone in your shoe, irritating you toward faith. John eleven twenty five 25 and 26. Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. Even if you fall asleep and go to the dust, if you believe in Christ, you're going to live. You're going to be awakened. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die eternal life. Therefore, this morning, church, do you believe this? Praise God. Worship team, would you come? Would you pray with me? Father, we stand in awe of your great wisdom that you chose to give us such great grace and instruction that this story of Lazarus has been written down for eternity so that we might look at death and gain a kingdom perspective. That we would find great hope even in the midst of the lamentable tragedy, the great sorrow of death. Knowing that it's not the end. That the great power, the great causal power of the voice of God will one day speak and dry bones will live. God, help us to live in the light of this truth. Yes, making the most of our time because the days are evil, our lives are short, but at the same time having great hope that our life will extend beyond the grave. Oh, and God, may we be faithful to send this message to others. This world is so sad, so hopeless. People are so discouraged. God, may the message of your resurrection for those who have faith in Christ be something that stands as a light in this community. Father, help us to be a part of that message. We give you thanks for it in Jesus' name.